Welcome back to Kenton and Habiba. My name is Habiba. For those of you that are new to the channel, welcome. I'm sure for those of you that are loyal subscribers, you're wondering, okay, this is a little different. Yes. So today you're going to have Dr. Tunau. If you don't know, I am an internist and have had over 20 years experience in internal medicine or adult medicine. And so today I thought I would use my medical background to give you something a little bit more substantial, um, a little bit more important to public health and to your health. Obviously, you've seen the headlines. We have all heard about the flu cases, the coronavirus that has been widespread, and I'm sure you and your family are concerned or should be. And there are some basics about viruses, the flu, and the coronavirus that I think are important to share with you. So if you are interested in this subject, and I hope you are, I hope you will tune in and let's get started. All right, let's start off with some basics. What's the difference between the common cold and the flu? With the common cold, the symptoms tend to be a little bit more gradual and not as severe, whereas with the flu, the symptoms tend to be a little bit more abrupt and pretty severe. Also, with the common cold, the virus that usually causes it is the rhinovirus. As you know, there are different types of viruses out there, but typically when you get the common cold, it's caused by the rhinovirus. Whereas when you get the flu, it's usually caused by influenza or the family of influenza. It could be influenza A, B, or C. Typically, influenza A. Okay, what are the typical symptoms of the cold? You might have a runny nose, you might have a cough, and typically with the flu, those symptoms are a little bit more severe. They might include all of the above, plus a headache. Um, you might have significant fatigue. You might have muscle aches, runny nose, headache, fever. How long do the symptoms last? Typically with the flu or the common cold, the symptoms may last about a week, but you might also have a lingering cough for up to two weeks, even after your cold or the flu has resolved. So a lot of times when patients come in to see their primary care physician, uh, they're coming because they're complaining that they still have a cough, which is pretty typical. Okay, so we already talked about some of the common symptoms of the flu. When should you be seen by your primary care doctor or your medical doctor or the emergency room? As an adult, you should typically be wanted you should typically be seen if you are having a persistent fever of above 101.3 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, if there is some confusion, especially if you are taking care of family members and there is some mental status changes, they're not acting themselves. Um, there is significant loss of appetite, so you're concerned they're not getting enough fluids, um, they're not urinating enough, or you can't remember the last time they went to the bathroom. Um, if there is, again, significant fever, that is a concern. If there is any mention of chest pain, um, any chest pain or chest pressure should take you to the emergency room or um, call your medical doctor. As I'm an internist, all of my focus tends to be on adult medicine, but most of us have children and you need to recognize what symptoms should be alarming enough to take you to the doctor or to take you to the emergency room with your child. So unlike an adult where you need to wait or be more concerned if the temperature is above 103 or 101.3, sorry, 101.3 degrees Fahrenheit in an adult. With children, anything above 100.3 uh, degrees Fahrenheit should be of concern. If they are sluggish, also if they are more irritable, if they are not drinking, if they are not eating, um, if you can't remember when they last used the bathroom, um, then you definitely should be concerned. If they are wheezing, which is something they don't normally do, that should also concern you. 
Also, you might want to be uh, concerned if they have fast breathing. That's another indication that there is some respiratory distress. So look out for all of these symptoms in addition to what we've already mentioned. Now, who is at high risk with the flu or who is at high risk for complications from the flu? Why are we concerned about certain populations more than the others? Who are these populations? What, what type of people are we more concerned about? Um, or who are at risk for developing complications from the flu? That's a question to you. <laughs> okay, well the answer is we are very concerned about children, especially children that are under the age of six months or even really children under the age of one. So children are generally um, at considered high risk. Pregnant women are also considered high risk. So they are definitely uh, one population that is at risk for complications from the flu. Anyone who is immunocompromised. Immunocompromised means anyone whose immune system is not as strong as a normal person. So anyone who is on chemotherapy, anyone who um, has had a bone transplant or some sort of transplant, like people who have had uh, uh, cancers of the blood, anyone who has HIV or AIDS, is immunocompromised. Anyone who basically is on chemotherapy, if I didn't say that already, and has had uh, or is being treated for a cancer. Anyone who has a chronic illness like diabetes, especially those that are uh, poorly controlled diabetics, are at risk for complications from the flu. Anyone who has chronic kidney disease, especially your dialysis patients, they are definitely high risk. Uh, for uh, complications from the flu. Also, people who are on uh, chronic steroids. Uh, a lot of people who have lung conditions like chronic COPD, uh, emphysema, they tend to be on steroids and therefore have a compromised immune system. So they would also be at high risk for complications from the flu. In addition to the people I mentioned, uh, people above the age of 65 are also considered high risk. And of course, uh, people in uh, long-term residential centers, uh, people who are in nursing homes or assisted living or basically in a large group setting for chronic care, those people are also considered at high risk for uh, complications from the flu. So we mentioned that certain populations are at a higher risk of complications from the flu. So what are these complications exactly? When we say complications, what do we mean? Well, complications mean an additional medical condition that might form after you have the flu or as a result of the flu that makes your condition a little bit more serious. So for example, you might be complicated with something uh, like otitis media, which just means a middle ear infection, which can be very uncomfortable. You might also uh, get bronchiolitis. You might also develop staph or strep pneumonia, which is very serious and in some cases may require ICU care. Um, or you might just develop sinusitis. So these are some complications as a result of the flu. So let's say you get the flu. How long are you contagious for? Or when did you, do you start being contagious? You can get the flu and you are actually contagious even before you start having symptoms. So for some people, you might be contagious a day, up to a day before you actually start showing symptoms. And you may remain contagious up to a week and sometimes even up to two weeks after you finish showing symptoms of the flu, which is why it's very easy to pass on infection to other people because sometimes you don't even know you have the infection when you passed it on. So what exactly causes the flu? What virus causes the flu? I think I mentioned earlier that influenza causes the flu. Now, there are different strains of influenza. There is influenza A, influenza B, influenza C. Influenza A causes the most, more severe uh, infection, and influenza A happens to be more common. Influenza A happens to be found in uh, humans and in also animals. 
Influenza B happens to be found in humans only. Influenza C happens to be found in humans and in pigs. And what's interesting is that Influenza A is most likely to mutate. So this is something we'll discuss a little bit later, but the virus can mutate, which is why it makes it difficult for researchers to find a vaccine. You've heard of different strains of viruses. For example, there is the H5N1 virus, strain of influenza, or otherwise known as the bird flu. So how do you get the virus? So how do you get the flu? How do you catch the flu? Well, typically you come in contact with some inhaled droplet. Somebody coughed or sneezed or even talked and you inhaled uh, the virus through a droplet which entered your eye, your nose or your mouth and invaded your upper respiratory tract and in severe cases went down into your lower respiratory tract and that is how you got the flu. When you get the flu or when you get the virus, it makes contact with your cells and replicates. So the thing about the virus or the influenza virus specifically is that when it is on the surface, it is easily killed and it requires a living body to replicate. So you are the great host or you become a vector to carry this virus and allow it to replicate in your body. When the virus enters your cells and begins to replicate, your body then mounts an immune response and makes antibodies trying to attack. As a result of these antibodies and this inflammation, you then have symptoms. To understand viruses, you have to understand the concept of antigenic shift. With antigenic shift, you get a virus that has mutated. So a virus typically has proteins on the surface. And this is how different researchers identify that particular virus based on the specific proteins on its surface. So with antigenic shift, the virus mutates. The virus uh, enters, say, an animal's body or it, an animal becomes infected with that virus. And that virus, which was now one strain, mutates within the animal. Now, let's say a human being consumes that virus or becomes you know closely exposed to that animal with now the mutated virus that person cannot mount an appropriate response to that mutated virus because they don't have the appropriate antibodies to recognize and attack that foreign cell or that foreign virus because when it comes to the flu like most illnesses prevention is better than cure prevention is better than cure so I think my number one advice to give you when it comes to how to prevent yourself from catching the flu, number one, wash your hands frequently. Can't say this enough, wash your hands frequently. You'll be surprised how many hundreds of times during the day that you come in contact with surfaces that are full of viruses and full of germs and full of bacteria in general. So wash your hands frequently with the appropriate soap and water for several minutes. Okay. Number two, avoid touching your face. Do you know how many times we touch our face? Sometimes you feel like an eyelash in your eye and you, you know, rubbing that to take it out or you rub your nose or you think your lips are ashy. I mean, there are so many times during the day that you have an opportunity to put things into your face. So you really have to get in the habit of avoiding touching your face unless you're using something clean um, to your face. The best advice also I would tell you is try as often as possible to wipe off surfaces that you come in contact with. I mean, you may not have any control over touching the handrail um, in the school bus or touching the handrail in the subway or touching the uh, uh, laptop or keyboard shared by everybody at work. Um, there's so many times where we are touching surfaces that are shared by the public 
um, you know, t even in your own house, you have several people that live in the house with you. Everybody is touching the handles of the fridge. Everybody is touching the countertop around the kitchen, touching the tables. We are all sharing and transmitting germs to each other. So again, my best advice would be to clean off those surfaces. I would suggest getting some bleach, uh, get a container like this. You can find a container like this at the dollar store, fill it up with water, and I usually put a cap full of bleach in it because bleach, as you might know, kills viruses. So not only does it kill bacteria, but it kills viruses. So this is one of the cheapest things you can do is get a container, fill it up, add your bleach, and go around and wipe off different areas in your house that are shared by everybody. Uh, the thing I like to have um, is these what I call bleach wipes. You know, Lysol makes one, and as you can see, it says kills 99% of viruses and bacteria. These disinfecting uh, wipes. If for whatever reason you can't find this in your grocery store or in your um, pharmacist uh, or pharmacy or convenience store, I'm gonna put a link in the description box below. Just check the link and you can actually buy this in bulk um, on Amazon and it can be delivered to your house or you can buy it for that college student because also think about all those college students sharing spaces, sharing all the, you know, they're all crowded. Um, or if you have someone in the military, these are things that I think are important. So you should get that. Um, I also use this, this is Clorox Foamer. Also sells, kills 99% of bacteria and viruses. So you can use this in your bathroom, you can use this in your kitchen, you can use this pretty much anywhere um, you want. So for example, I think of even my cell phone. Yeah, so how many times do you come in contact with the public and then you pick up your phone uh, to talk to someone? So even your phone probably is loaded with tons of bacteria and possibly viruses on it. Um, I wipe my keyboard off often. I wipe the table that I work on often. Uh, another important advice I would give you is that if you do feel like you have a cold or you do feel like you have the flu possibly, the best way you can avoid transmitting it to others is stay home. Don't be one of those people that feels like I have to go out to work. I have to go to school today. I can't miss work. No, stay home because you're doing everybody else a favor. The worst thing you can do is go there and spread all of these germs and viruses to everybody else and they then take it home to their families. So I think the most conscientious thing you can do is stay home. The other thing is when you're at home and you are sick, um, try to make sure that you cough into your hand or cough into your arm and that you're not just coughing outward without thinking about everybody else. Um, stay away from sick people, which sometimes sounds selfish, but you really have to protect yourself as much as possible. If you know somebody is sick, stay away. Um, it's interesting that you need to be at least six feet away from someone if they are sick and have the flu because you know, if they cough or they sneeze um, or sometimes even talk and you are less than six feet away, you can get some of those respiratory secretions um, into your face or even onto your hand and then onto your hand, you take your hand and you put it to your face. So be very careful about protecting your space when you know that someone around you is sick. According to the CDC, the best thing you can do for yourself or the best form of protection you can have is to get the flu vaccine. Now, some of you are thinking, well, we're in January going into, uh, going into February. Is it not too late to get the flu vaccine? No, it is not. You can get the flu vaccine up until, depending on where you live and depending on the type of weather you have and how cold it's going to remain or how long your winters are, typically you can get the flu vaccine up until May. So you might need to check with your family doctor um, or you might need to check with the health department uh, to see if they still have availability of the flu vaccine. So let's talk about the flu vaccine itself. 
Now, it's interesting, I often hear patients say that um, they took the flu vaccine and it made them sick, which may not necessarily be the case. Sometimes that could be the case, but most of the time that is not the case. What's important to know is that uh, the flu vaccine takes about two weeks for you to mount an immune response. So in order for you to mount an adequate immune response or to have sufficient antibodies, it takes two weeks. So what that means is that let's say you got the flu vaccine today, but then tomorrow you come in contact with someone who got the flu or who has the flu. You can still get the flu even though you uh, got the flu vaccine because it takes two weeks to develop sufficient antibodies or to mount the appropriate immune response. So you might be aware that there are two different types of vaccines used to prevent you from getting the flu. The first one, which is the most common, is the injectable type. It's usually injected into your deltoid muscle or a muscle in your body. It's injected into that. It contains a mixture of three killed, three killed uh, uh, viruses or three killed strains of virus predicted to dominate the incoming season. The second type of vaccine uh, typically is the inhaled version which contains weakened virus. So that version which is inhaled contains weakened virus. So not everybody um, is uh, appropriate or is an appropriate person to get the weakened uh, form of the vaccine. So you need to talk to your physician or talk to your medical provider to see what is appropriate for you. But there are two different versions of the uh, flu vaccine. So how does your medical provider know that you have the flu? Well, sometimes the medical provider, your physician, or whoever you go to see um, may uh, use their own judgment based on your symptoms. Uh, based on your history and symptoms, they might be willing to treat you uh, with medication or they might uh, suggest symptomatic care. Uh, but if they are going to test you, they would use a swab to your nostril and that usually results in a rapid, uh, rapid test or that usually is the rapid test which tells us whether you have uh, the virus or not. It's not always specific for whether you have influenza A, B, or C, but it tells us if you are positive for the influenza test. Now, if you end up in the hospital or unfortunately end up going to the emergency room or a hospital, um, they can do other testing and they may test your sputum um, or they may require a blood test which can also detect um, whether or not you are positive for the influenza virus. Although I am suggesting that you call your medical provider and let them know your symptoms if you think you have the flu, uh, there are many occasions where you may not choose to see a doctor or you may not go to the doctor's office uh, if you think you have the flu. But if you do believe that you have risk factors, which we have mentioned previously, then I do suggest that you see a medical provider as soon as possible. As there are times where if you wait too late, the antiviral medication like Tamiflu uh, does not really serve any purpose and they, your provider might decide not to treat you at all, at all because you waited uh, more than 48 hours uh, to be seen from the time that your symptoms started. So again, if you think you are in one of the risk factor groups that I previously mentioned and that you are at risk for complications from the flu, then you should definitely be seen by a medical provider to treat you for the flu. Okay, so let's talk about the headlines. Let's talk about what's been all over the news, this coronavirus.
How does it affect you and your family? Should you be worried? Should you not be worried? A lot of us still have questions. I think even as a medical provider, I have a lot of questions. We don't have clearly all the answers. We know how viruses may behave, but this appears to be a completely new virus. And as I talked about previously, you know, the whole idea of antigenic shift and how viruses mutate, you can see how that can be a challenge for scientists or research researchers to not only identify this virus, but to also uh, come up with a vaccine to uh, prevent or treat this virus. So anyway, I just thought I would read some of the headlines that I saw in the last few days. Uh, you know, as we know that uh, certain countries, specifically China, has been affected the most. They have now found new cases in Europe and uh, even in Australia. Uh, so far, as far as we know, the United States has only had two cases and those two cases came from China. Um, uh, I read that one of the cases was recovering in a hospital in Washington, D.C. As you know, or as you should be aware, hundreds have been affected, probably more, if, you know, if not more than that. Several have been dead or several have been killed by this coronavirus. Uh, I, I, it's, it's scary. I don't know about you, but again, I think it's very scary. Therefore, it's important for us to remain informed. So I'm going to link in the description box where I think or where I suggest you uh, not only get more information, but if you are watching the news, certainly that's one way to get information through, you know, reporters, but also you can go directly to the CDC, Center for Disease Control, if you're in the United States, and also the World Health Organization. I will list their uh, websites so you can continue to get more information or up-to-date information information that's relevant for you, especially if you're thinking of traveling. Wuhan, which apparently has more than 11 million people and is the size of New York City, um, has pretty much been quarantined. So there are basically you can't travel there. You can't take a bus there. You can't take a train there. Can you imagine what that must must be like? I'm sure those people are terrified. I can't imagine what their healthcare workers must be going through taking care of all these people knowing that they themselves are putting themselves at risk. Um, I, I just know that that has to be terrifying and I pray that their doctors and, serve, uh, and scientists um, you know, find a way to treat these people because it will impact the world. Actually, it is impacting the world. Um, I know that they are conflicted as of right now. They have not made this a global issue, so to speak. Uh, they're warning against non-essential travel. Um, authorities are worried about this becoming like another SARS. I don't know if many of you are aware, back uh, in the early 2000s when we had SARS, I remember I was in residency and it was it was terrifying to hear all the different um, you know cases of people that were dying due to this virus. Um, what's what I find particularly interesting is how they figured out where this thing may have originated, and uh, specifically in Wuhan, they mentioned that you know they had a fish market, and um, previously in China they are i guess known to sell what they call illegal meat so meat that usually most people would not necessarily eat around you know the world but there culturally uh certain meats that included rodents that included uh things like snakes hedgehogs uh wild rats uh were typically being sold in different markets and um uh, of recent, they had banned the sell, uh, they had banned the sale of these illegal meats. But recently, or over the years, they started selling them again. So, can you imagine having all these caged animals uh, being sold uh, right next to seafood? So, as I talked previously about, again, the antigenic shift. You have uh, viruses that were not found in human beings that have infected these rodents 
and then these rodents are being consumed by humans or in close contact with humans i was thinking about how you know a lot of this points at china and how they consume these foods most of us would would see as unsafe and inappropriate and almost inhumane uh, when you consider how some of these animals are treated but in reality i think about a lot of third world countries where they consume bush meat and i'm thinking specifically at for myself as a child when i used to live in nigeria and i know some of you might take this the wrong way but honestly this is not just a problem in china this is a problem in a lot of third world countries where people are consuming what they call exotic meats or what they call bush meat or what they call um you know illegal meat um, I remember as a child being offered rat meat or what was called bush rat and actually being forced to eat it and told that it tasted like chicken. And I also remember my father uh, saying he had gone to a small village and he had been given uh, bush meat and usually they don't even tell you what's in it. But he uh, talked about staring the stew and in it was the hand of a monkey. There was a monkey's paw in it and he was disgusted. And I'm just thinking like, God, I hope people can learn from what's going on in China and stop these practices of eating meat that they consider you know either exotic or powerful or somehow have some super amazing medicinal qualities if they could just stop and look again as much as the world right now wants to point at china what i am saying is that i believe that this is a problem that exists in many countries and i hope so, that now these practices will be abolished or the governments will do what they can to uh, make it very difficult for people to continue to uh, you know practice this way of living why religion you know people can look at religion and see the importance of religion I myself honestly am not a religious person I consider myself a spiritual person um, who definitely believes in God and I can see the importance of religion and I, I and I know this takes it on a different tangent but again this is my opinion and I can see how sometimes religion is important when it comes to the guidelines that it sets so I know for example in Islam or in Judaism there are certain foods that you should not eat and I understand part of that those guidelines were because foods in the past were considered dangerous because they conveyed disease because they promoted disease if they were not prepared appropriately so i can see you know how religion plays a part in helping to guide uh, people to eat what is appropriate and sometimes in certain cultures where they don't have these beliefs they end up uh you know eating certain things that are dangerous to their health i am really curious to know what your thoughts are on this subject uh when it comes to culture when it comes to religion and how we choose certain foods so i'm going to stop there but i hope that you did get something out of um i guess my discussion about viruses and about the flu vaccine and about uh the flu itself and you will do or take appropriate precautions yourself in your own home um, i also will leave in the description box uh, perhaps links to books that i think might be helpful about viruses here is one book that uh, kenton and i have uh, it's called micro terrors micro terrors it's the complete guide to bacterial and fungal infections that threaten our health this is an old book but it's really fascinating it's really fascinating in here um and maybe this might not be in the link below but i if i can put a a similar uh book i will so there's another book that i think about the coming plague how many of you have heard about that book the coming plague that's another interesting book about viruses so i hope you have found this interesting or insightful do your own research 
uh, speak to your own provider. This here is just for information. I am in no way telling you how you should be treated or uh, what vaccines you should get or not get. I am simply making suggestions. And again, discuss this with your own medical provider. Um, and if you found this video helpful, please go ahead and give me a thumbs up. Um, share this with anyone you think might uh, gain some knowledge from this. And thank you for watching. God bless. Bye.